33 minutes past the hour into the Jeff Santo show that you are tuned into. Coming to you live from the South Coast, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We end our Fridays um, almost 99% of the time with our next guest. He is the Renaissance man of the Jeff Santo show. He is a musician. Uh, check him out on YouTube. Uh, he is a great activist. I've been in the streets uh, supporting uh, Ms. Sawant and many other uh, progressives. And, uh, of course, he is the executive director of Democracy Watch News. He's our good friend, Mark Taylor Canfield. I have a quick song here for just a, just a couple words for Vladimir Putin and some of his friends in the U.S. Okay. <laughs> Boss man, won't you hear us when we call? Man, won't you hear us when we call? I said, now you ain't so big now. You just talk, that's all. Ow. Yeah. Hey, hey, Jeff, happy GGIF. Hey, happy you? TGIF, man, and thank God it is here because uh, <laughs> it's been a long week, man. Hey, I don't think we've seen that guitar um, since we've been doing the video. That's that's a new one. I like it. No, it's used to hanging out back there on the stand next to the David Bowie poster, but uh, it's red. It so, was just you know, a prop. It was a, just it a prop. In. No, I really love real thing. It is my favorite guitar. It actually has a really super low string action so you can play it really fast. I can slide it, do a lot, you know. It's got a really narrow neck, it's light, it's easy to carry around, so I really like this one. It's my studio guitar. So the song I'm working on right now is called The Glorious Machine, and it's actually about guitars, you know, or cars or whatever you want to apply it to in your own mind. But to me, uh, it started writing about my friends in Seattle, hanging out at really historic places like Oh, Easy Street Records. I should tell you, we just got a chance to go out on the water yesterday in our kayaks and we ended up visiting Seattle's best beach, Alki Beach. I don't know if you if you hung out there when you were here in Seattle, but it's where all the hot rod vintage folks like to show off their cars and motorcycles. Uh -huh. And it's got the that's where Eddie Vedder moved when he first came here because it's right on the beach, right? He's he's kind of a beachy kind of guy. So uh, we, you know, Macklemore, he lives up on a big house in uh, Queen Anne with all the rich people, but Eddie was down there with the working folks. But actually, California Street and West... That's why he's the best. In the city. It's, it reminds me of California, and there's this place called Easy Street Records, and it's incredible. They have a cafe inside and a bar, and people here are really serious about their music. So you go in, and it's a lot of vinyl, and they have their turntable set up so that you can have your listening stations. Uh, you can awesome. listen to the vinyl before you buy you it. you got to take me there, man. Really good IPA. You got to take me there when I fly out. Um, that's that place. would be that would be a place to sort of meet up. I tell you, hey, uh, you know we we've talked a lot about your great city, and and I really truly is one of America's best, one of the world's best. Um, but you know there there's such because you mentioned already one of the the great people um, that uh, that come from or move there. Was Vetter bo born in Chicago? Is that the connection to the Cubs, or is he just a Cubs fan for a reason that? you know, we don't know about, or did he, did he move to Seattle or did he actually born here, born there in, in Seattle? I, I, so I don't think he was born here actually. I'll, I'll look it up, but I, I don't think he was born here. Um, not yeah, all of the grunge guys. Chicago he, connection. Yeah. I mean, we could find out really quick. There's this thing called Google. Shh, don't tell anyone, but, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do that right now, actually. Um, so yeah. uh, excuse me. As I, I don't to... think he was in Seattle his whole life. If he was, then, um, he didn't really come onto the scene till later. And before that was Andrew Wood and this band called Malfunction that kind of really influenced a lot of the grunge rockers. Uh, and I think Eddie was one of those guys that was really influenced by Andrew Wood, who unfortunately, like, uh, unfortunately, uh, other great musicians in Seattle died of a heroin overdose. So. Uh, another one of those. He was born in Evanston, Illinois, a suburb of uh, the great uh, city of Chicago, in on there December twenty third, nineteen sixty four. He's uh, about my so age. He, yeah, cool. so he was a Cubs fan because that's the where, who else are you going to root for at that in Illinois? You know. Yeah, well, it could be a White Sox fan, but you know, 
he chose the cut. No, no. That's okay. Wait, well, no, sorry. I don't want to get into that. But uh, yeah, no. <laughs> but I always see him like on pictures of him on paddle boards and stuff. You know, he's he's also a really outdoorsy kind of guy, surfer kind of dude. So uh, yeah. you know, we share some of the same interests, which is kind of cool. But I, I wanted to let people know the Seattle teacher strike just ended on Wednesday. They got oh, a seven percent. Oh, very good. This year, three percent, and then four percent. The incremental raises it's not enough but it you know it, it was enough to send the kids back to school on wednesday so uh shout That's out to awesome. all the teachers and the service industry workers right it used to be the hard hats and the manufacturing industry workers the factory workers that were the big you know the teamsters and the and the big you know players on the union scene but look who's really expanding unionization and um you know increasing the expanding the franchise and that's definitely the service industry workers amazon folks starbucks folks and the teachers as well but especially amazon and and uh starbucks and that you know uh, that's a huge issue here of course because of well the i want i want to talk to you about that because you know eddie vetter is the good uh and um you know bezos and and uh schiltz are the are the bad uh, of the great uh, city of Seattle. Everybody has it. You know, we have our problems here in Boston, too, um, in Massachusetts. But uh, more Republican uh, governors, you know, the last 25 years. Um, so here, actually more than that, 35, I guess, going back to 1990, two Democrats. That's uh, Deval Patrick um, and will presumably be um, our good friend, uh, Miss Healy. And we'll, we'll see what happens there. Anyways, um, the facts are, are that um, Starbucks are doing a lot of great work. I mean, the Starbucks employees uh, unionizing. But, you know, the bargaining is still not there yet. Um, and what I'm hearing is that Schiltz has called out the vultures, lobbyists, and are, are preventing and, and are actually, I guess, they're, they're taking the stores that have, human, uh, that have unionized and they're and they're uh, reducing staff, so that means less people actually there to vote for the union. So I mean, it's 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 the sleaziness that's going on that Schultz is uh, allowing, and this from the guy who thought he was going to be the president on the and, and get exactly. the Democratic nomination. You know, this this is, this is sleaze. Out. Yeah, I always say like you know this is the Emerald City. That's our nickname. So uh, you know, Portland's the Rose City. This is the Emerald City. And uh, pay no attention to the men behind the curtains. One of them is Mr. Schultz. There's also this guy named Bezos, somebody else named Gates. Yep. And they're always yep. behind what goes on here because they got the money and people, uh, the you know, money money talks and, uh, you know, BS walks. So they just, they, they throw money at people for their campaigns and stuff and they get stuff done. Uh, but yeah, it's, you know, there should be major boycotts. I mean, Harvey K, our, our buddy who was on earlier, I really love watching him on your show. He, um, uh, the best. In some way, I consider him kind of a mentor, although he doesn't probably realize that at this point. But uh, there really should be <laughs> bo major boycotts at Starbucks cafes across the country. And he mentioned that in one of his tweets. He was like, well, you know, occupy Starbucks, you know, question mark, because the National Labor Relations Board once again had to go after them, just slapped him with another major complaint um, about, you know, union busting activities in Pittsburgh. And mm -hmm. we've had uh, Capitol Hill hearings on this subject. The employees here in Seattle just rallied the other day outside the company's headquarters. Um, they've been accused of firing union workers, delaying bargaining and withholding benefits from workers who support the unionizing effort. So it's an all out battle at the moment. And I hope people remember that the next time they think about visiting a Starbucks coffee shop, those guys are union busters. I know some people, especially in Seattle, are seriously addicted to caffeine. Um, they're junkies, but I, I mean, I remember when I first moved to Seattle, watching people line up at 6 a.m. in the rain uh, at the espresso carts for their daily morning dose. But personally, I'm wow. not a fan of Starbucks coffee, never have been. I don't visit their original store down a Pike Place Market that attracts tourists from all over the world. Uh, I prefer better Italian style espresso and coffee like Cafe Vitas and Cafe Paradiso here, which are locally run. Cafe Lajo is oh, another yeah. one. The you know, the baristas there are treated much better and those companies deserve people's support. I cannot say the same thing about Starbucks. I'm not going into a Starbucks uh, unless it's the, I'm going in there to support the unionizing efforts of the workers. Otherwise, uh, you know, I'm that. boycotting. Yeah, it's not a big issue. For I'm me with you. I, I like think coffee. that we should uh, we should do that, man. That's just uh, what I what I have seen and heard is just disgusting. Uh, and of course, Bezos, you know, and they take over the NFL. You know, you and I've been talking. We're going to talk about the Seattle uh, Seahawks and Russell Wilson in a second. 
But, you know, on Thursday nights, it used to be, you know, you turn on and I think at, for one time they were on TBS and then the uh, NFL network, which is most cable packages, or maybe you can um, I get now you got to get a, a separate prescription for Prime in order to watch uh, Thursday night football. And, uh, you know, listening to some sports talk radio uh, this afternoon, you know, they were they were saying that, you know, it was, uh, it, you know, the, the whole idea of a spinning rainbow, which is what you get when you, you have problems with the Internet, um, is what people got went last night and watching the Chargers and the, uh, and the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, I'm sorry. I mean, why do we have to, you know, watch games on Thursday night to begin with? Saturday and Sunday are fine enough for me. Monday night football, fine. But I mean, really, we have to have it now. We're going to have to pay extra just to watch the games. And apparently, it was a decent game last night. But you know, I, I'm not going to. I mean, I love sports, but you know, it's this is ridiculous. Why? Why are we, you know, being forced for Amazon? I mean, just as an example, baseball, the Apple package for baseball, which again is more annoying for me because you got to, you know, log into the computer and all the other stuff to do it. But as opposed to all in you know, an MLB network or, or ESPN or whatever. And, you know, but at least it's free. These guys want you to pay <laughs> Amazon, the richest man in the world, along with Elon Musk. I mean, come on. Yeah, that's, it's Ugh. a scramble to monetize sports online. And we're in a different world now. I knew it was going to be different. I, for years, I've kind of avoided cable television for many reasons. And um, I was watching everything online and slowly the news organizations started broadcasting online. And then pretty soon you had some 24 hour live streams, uh, news uh, that you can go to. Now it's getting to the point where unless you're on YouTube, which still, you know, it's owned by Google, but it's, it's still free. Um, you know, unless you're on a, a free platform like that, yeah, to watch sports in the United States. Uh, luckily, uh, if you have uh, a digital TV and you can, put a really nice size paper clip into that little <laughs> cable input. It actually works pretty well when you live in the middle of the city. So you can pick up local sports here um, through the commercial digital channels, which doesn't cost. So you can still do that, but anybody who lives outside the city limits is gonna have a really hard time picking that up unless you have an amazing uh, antenna system. So, uh, and that's that's the old school, right? That's ter what they call terrestrial television, You know, where you actually have an, an antenna. Yeah, um, no, occasionally those I are the days. That way, I grew yeah. up with uh, here in Boston, Channel 38, which would broadcast the Red Sox and Bruins games for years, and that's where you would watch the games. And you'd, you'd have to get the the antenna with you know the the uh, aluminum foil, and you put it on the antenna, it makes it a little bit clearer. First in black and white, and then in color. And you know, and, and those were the days back in the 1970s, <laughs> watching the great Bobby Orr and yeah. all that. But the fact is, is that you know, even even through the 80s, you know. You know, most of the games were still on, on as you say, terrestrial television, uh, you know, the VHF channels. And then eventually they went to paid uh, uh, subscriptions, which are actually owned by the, the local teams in many markets, like the Red Sox uh, and John Henry, who also owns the Globe, you know, owns well, Nesson yeah. or a part, and the Bruins own the other part. So there you go. And, you know, it's I think it's a 60-40 for the Red Sox. But the, the point is, is that you're right. And now, though... I mean, you know, you, you figure you got everything caught up, you know. And if you want to watch a game outside of the market, you got to pay extra for this prescription. And again, Apple's not even doing that. Well, you also uh, have you the know. local blackouts. You also have local blackouts. So occasionally I can't watch a game just because it's in my city. And, it, it you know, it's, uh, by the way, they sold out the stadium on Monday night for Monday Night Football, the new ESPN's version. And it was... Uh, uh, I guess that's 69,000 people or something. So it was huge. Yeah. It was a huge historic moment in Seattle. But you can listen to these games on your local commercial radio sports station here in Seattle. There is still one left where you can right. do that. Just thank it's God for the radio, games. right? Yeah, so working class and poor people, they're listening to the radio. And, and a lot of them are working at the time while they're listening. But, yeah, that's that's yeah. America. But, yeah, it's been the scramble to monetize a lot of this content. You know, we're doing it in the news industry, too. We, you know, writing a whole new mm -hmm. business plan for democracy, watch news and stuff. Now the market's always changing. And for a while, nobody could figure out how to monetize um, online uh, content. Now everybody's doing it. And there are so many movie services, too. Uh, there's Netflix versus Amazon Prime versus this versus that. And in order to actually watch all the movies you want to watch, you yeah, you end up having to su subscribe to many different services. And after a while, it starts to add up. You know, it's not it's not cheap. 
So yeah, and yeah. the movies theater hey. are, are not as cheap as they used to be. And let me tell you, you know, if you're really lucky, if you know somebody who's got, uh, you know, a, uh, somebody they work with or family member that has season tickets, because NFL football is an amazingly expensive. It's really, really tough yep. for just in class. There's only one game there. a week. Yeah, yeah it's on and baseball, it's 162 cool. games, 80 games in the yeah. uh, in the home stadium. Hey, uh, I want really I want to get your take here because uh, there's this this to me oh, I, I was watching. Yes, Russell Wilson exactly, uh, yeah. and and your backup to Russell Wilson, who's now the starter and was on fire the first half. What he missed like two passes, I think, twenty two for twenty four, some ridiculous number like that, and it was so great. And and the way it ended is the the coach of the uh, of the Denver Broncos, not a, not exactly a rocket scientist uh, by any stretch, decided not to um, give the ball to Russell uh, Wilson, you know, to be the home uh, wrecker and uh, ruin the Seahawks opening uh, day uh, a victory, um, you know, and they took it and gave it to the field goal kicker, and the field goal kicker missed the uh, missed the uh, uh, the kick. It, of course, was a 64-yard kick, which is not the easiest yeah. thing to do. Most people don't hit it. So it was just Indeed. it was just great. A very appropriate ending for a, a very slime-like act for Russell Wilson, who I used to like a lot. I know you did, too. And, um, you know, he decided to take the money and run, and he did. And Arrivederci, hey, Russell okay. Wilson, you, you lost it. I just uploaded a video at YouTube. It's probably going to go viral. It's called Why... Uh, Geno Smith is a great quarterback and I just took highlights from the game and I mixed it in with Troy Aikman and some of the other commentators just, you know, because their minds were blown too. From the very beginning of the game, even the ESPN sportscasters were very much backing uh, uh, Geno. They just said from the beginning and they didn't, didn't make any apologies about that, that they were backing him, they, that he was the underdog and you know everybody wanted to, him to win. So he did. And it was an amazing moment in Seattle sports history. Some of the highlights just blow my mind. I mean, talk about threading the needle. I've never seen passes like he threw a couple of them. The defender was right in the face of the receiver and somehow he was able to connect. No interceptions, 200 yards. Uh, you know, Seattle played well. They got very few penalties. Denver Broncos, not so well. 12 penalties, 105 yards. That'll kill anybody's game. I don't care if you're Russell Wilson yeah. or, or whatever. So sloppy affair. Uh, some of the decisions that were made, uh, Russell Wilson being so cocky that he forgot to check the game clock a couple times. The Seattle Seahawks are so loud. They create literally seismic, seismic events that are registered at the Both University men. of Washington. On the, the crowd is so loud. They can't hear the calls, and it and they always end up getting delay of game calls and, and uh, or, you know, people leaving the line too, too early during these games. But – it, it was it was kind of mind-blowing. I mean, I saw some amazing superstar plays by Geno Smith, and he is the underdog. I mean, he's been here in the league for eight years, and he's barely gotten a chance to start. So, it, you know, he did, what, three games last year? He did really well when Russell broke his finger. Uh, he's very consistent. He's a veteran. He knows how to run an offense, and he knows what he's doing. But as you know, I've always been a big fan of Russell Wilson. But um, – by the way, the Seahawks totally stomped on Denver during the, our Super Bowl with them. But, but as you know, I, I've been a big fan of Russell Wilson. But I'll tell you what, Jeff, now my favorite quarterback is Geno Smith because he's such a great Gino. underdog story. Yeah, and the whole crowd yeah. was chanting his name from the moment they booed Russell Wilson the moment he stepped on the game yep. during the pregame warm-ups. And then when, uh, <laughs> when Geno came out, everybody started chanting the entire crowd. So from the very beginning of the game, they, they were behind Geno and they were chanting for him. Now, some people have criticized the Seattle fans for being a little too harsh, but this is the Seattle, you know, this is the Seattle of like, you know, riots in the streets and tear gas and, you know, May Day riots. So, you know, this is not a, a, always a friendly town. And when it comes to sports, especially the Seahawks, you know, it can be rough. But to be honest, I found that the, the major riff that had been going on between Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson that they covered Russell up Wilson. and lied about, that left me feeling pretty miffed because as the end of last season, they, as of that time, they told us that uh, they we were given assurances that Wilson wasn't going anywhere and that Carroll didn't want him to go anywhere. And the opposite was actually true. We now know. So Seattle, that was a complete lie. You got bamboozled by your own um, team. But as it turns out, that riff went all the way back to 2018. And I'm not taking anything away from Russell's talent because he's a phenomenal, phenomenal player. But his reaction to the whole trade was pretty crass and arrogant, in my opinion. And he made it very clear at the press conference that he didn't care 
about what the Seattle fans think about him. It's all about Russell uh, or Danger Russ, yep. as he likes to call himself. Yeah, if you saw that that's suit, his... it was just ridiculous. You know, I mean, yeah, that's it's not that's about the. That that's who he, he was, was, and and you know, and I yeah. think whether it's it's his uh, Hollywood wife or you know, uh, musician, you know, and very talented and so forth, whether that was part of it or or it was something else. In my view, you know, this is uh, this is another another examine of an of an athlete, you know, uh, going after the green. And I'm not talking about uh, being environmentally uh, focused. I'm talking about just the green backs, and uh, that's all they really care about. I mean, you know, this is. We were this hoodwinked it was. And, yeah. by our own team. They lied to us. And, you know, that happens in professional sports. It's all about the money. But really, in this case, it's a lot different from somebody like Tom Brady in your neck of the woods, right, who gave up a lot of salary just so for the because of the cap, just so they could hire good players and go to the Super Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he left yeah, later, of exactly. course, because he had his own differences with Belichick, which is, you know, a similar kind of thing. But my, my heart is with Gino. He's the working man's quarterback. He's kind of scruffy. He's a lot less glamorous. He's not quite as fashionable or, you know, model-esque as Russell Wilson. He's not as cocky. He just wants to win right. games, and he's really yeah. hungry right. because he's been on the yeah. sidelines for so long. So he beat the odds, which is pre precisely what they love on Monday Night Football, right, to see that happen. Troy Aikman and the sportscasters were totally ranting and, and drooling for him. So throughout the, se the entire game, uh, you know, the crowd was totally behind him. And, you know, I think it was a classic NFL moment in history that I'll remember. And I know a lot of other people who were there will remember because the crowd was insane. I mean, I, I've been to Seahawks games before and I've had to wear earplugs and, you know, I, I'm in a rock band. So, you know, I should be used to loud. Yeah. Oh, no. I we. So my friend I mean, is. I would is love to go to a game. Together. That was great. And then Sherman looked him up after the game, after the Seahawks beat him. <laughs> and. and they had that meme with, you know, Sherman, Richard Sherman uh, walking up to Tom Brady because Tom Brady told him, told him, I'll see you after the game, after we win. Well, they lost. Yeah. So yeah. Richard Sherman went to find him and they have that meme saying, you know, you know, you mad, you mad, bro, because Brady was pissed. <laughs> he was so pissed that he got beat by the Seahawks. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure Russell Wilson was, too. That was supposed to be his big uh, initiation into his relationship with the Broncos. They, they had super high hopes for him. The hype was incredible. Meanwhile, everybody was ignoring Gino, and Gino shined. I mean, he had an almost perfect game. You know, he, I think it was 20, 23 for 28 or something at the end of the game. He did really great. No interceptions. Some of the throws were just immaculate. I couldn't believe it. He was scrambling. They talk about Russell Wilson scrambling. Uh, well, they were putting the blitz on Gino, and he was getting away from them, and there was nothing they could do about it. And then he ran once. I, I think he ran for like 18 yards in one play, and he didn't hit for the sidelines either. Gino, next time, head for the sidelines. Don't take those linebackers on directly. Okay, we need you. We don't need you hurt. But he he yeah, had that moment where he was yeah. like, so maintain, the maintain, maintain, maintain some consistency so we can okay. have you play next week. Yes. Uh, hey, Mark, always uh, fantastic uh, checking in with you. Um, Please uh, keep that guitar handy because we'd love to have you play it uh, next time um, because that's that's just uh, solid gold, man. I love that stuff. Um, so looking Thanks, good sir. in your neighborhood, my friend. Uh, so great to have you. And uh, on the way to ending the Friday uh, oh, yeah. work week for us here on the Jeff Santos Show. Um, Check out the MTC report. <laughs> we'll do, man. Check it out. Uh, you too. Hey, you have too. a great weekend, dude. Enjoy yourself. You too. Okay. Take care. Thanks, All Jeff. right. I want to thank uh, our great team here uh, in Boca Raton, Florida, Freddie and Josh and Dan for all their great work this week and all the craziness down there with my friends at Comcast and friends at uh, all the storms. That's Anyways, thank you, folks. Have a great weekend. My name is Jeff Santos. Time for me to say I gotta go.